Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Shootingmaker with Phil Harburger Park Conservancy, and we are happy to be able to bring to you today live on Facebook a talk about landscaping with native plants. We have Joan Miller, who is uh, an expert uh, landscaper uh, for native plants with the Native Plant Society. And we also have with us uh, Drake White, who is also an expert in landscaping um, with the Nectar Bar. And she is uh, going to give us tips about how these plants uh, will affect wildlife. So here we go. Joan? All right, well, good morning. Um, so just so you know, online there is a, um, a spreadsheet that you can follow along with that has information that both Drake and I will talk about. And on the back side, I even got a little map, it's in color, um, of where we're going to stop along the way. We're going to cover 13 plants here. And these are plants that are you more find, for the most part, in the wild that you may already have in your yard or um, you can get it in a nursery, but they're a little more wild than a lot of the, the native plants that we're used to. So I'm going to just jump right in. This is our first one here. This one's called buttonbush. And buttonbush, it's, um, it's kind of a wild-looking shrub with absolutely gorgeous um, puffball-shaped flowers that, as you can probably see, and Drake will talk more about, but a little, lot of little insects on it. Um, it likes its feet a little wet, so you want it in a wet part of your yard, and, um, but it's very drought tolerant, especially once it's, it's uh, established. You'd mostly find it along creeks and rivers, and, um, and as you can see, if, I don't know if you got a good look from what Teresa showed at first. Um, this is a huge plant right here, and this is probably several. So don't let that scare you. It's, um, you can prune it back very hard to fit in a smaller place in your landscape, but you probably want it, still you want to give it some space. So um, it might be one of the more challenging ones, but certainly a very rewarding plant for your landscape. Um, do you want to go in and talk a little this, bit? Oh, yes. And um, real quick, may I just uh -huh. interject? If anybody has any questions, please put them in the comments and we will try to address them. And if uh, we don't get to it during the talk, we will also answer afterwards. Um, so this here is a great um, plant that you could use um, in an area, maybe on your house, property, or business, um, where water runs off and it stays kind of damp. Um, but also, I've tried in a test bed um, if you make like in a little area where your air conditioning condensation kind of drains out, this is a perfect spot. And you can, as Joan said, um, kind of prune it back, hard prune it to keep it to where you want it. If you want it to be three foot by three foot, it's happy and it'll do fine just with that. The scent of these flowers can be very potent um, and it smells very good, a very spicy um, type of, I almost said flavor, not flavor, but scent. Um, and all kinds of pollinators love it, big and small. Um, it is an excellent nectar source for all types of pollinators. But a very um, easy um, to deal with native uh, shrub once established. Yep. And also note too that there's, um, there's some of these have already, they're going to seed right now. So another birds would like to eat on those as well. Um, and another thing too, in terms of where do you get this plant, if you've got a drainage running through your property, you might have it already. Um, you can buy it in some nurseries. Sometimes we have it at our plant sale. And um, I mean, I'm not great growing things from seed, but I'm pretty sure. Have you grown this from seed? Um, I have, and it takes it's a lot of patience. A lot of patience. <laughs> it takes a lot of patience. So, um, in order for it to kind of be a substantial plant, it takes a couple of years if you're growing from seed. But it's not hard. It's just patience. Yeah, which is the which is the the fact with a lot of the woody plants too. So, um, but anyway, that's just I mean it's just such a stunning stunning uh, flower on that. So. So and the next where we're going to walk to is um, a wheat tree over here. This one, I believe, probably was was planted here when the park was was created, because um, it's it's there's there's less trunks to it. It's very it's vase shaped. It can be pruned just beautifully. Um, 
out in, in rural areas, people think of it as a really trashy shrub like mesquite, but that's because it gets mowed over and plowed over. And um, yeah. What is the name again? Weesach. H U I S A C H E. Weesach. And uh, so, anyway, so when it gets mowed, it then comes back with multiple, multiple thin uh, trunks. And um, it can be very weedy looking and it's got some thorns on it so it can be impenetrable. Great wildlife plant though. Um, and you know, birds will nest in it. And, um, but it's got that beautiful airy quality of the leaves. It's, it forms a really nice airy shaded, you know, sunny shade area underneath. And, um, which gives you a lot of space to be able to plant things underneath to create good yeah, understory yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, I think... Understory is very important yeah. when we're talking about native trees and trying to build wildlife habitat. Um, and that is one of my favorite things about this tree. Besides, when it's in bloom, my goodness, is it a showstopper. Um, many times you've probably seen this as you're going down different areas of town, but definitely 1604 loop. Um, in the spring, when all on the side of the roads where it's bright yellow trees, it's most likely this one here in full bloom. And the scent of it is really, really nice as well. Um, completely, usually covered in bees <laughs> in spring and butterflies absolutely love it. But great nesting site for birds. Um, and like Joan had said, you know, if it's not in an area where it's constantly mowed, it does get a nice shaped trunk um, and doesn't get very, um, like the little root stuff coming up to make it more like a shrub. The sprouts, yeah. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, how blue bonnets are iconic in the spring in San Antonio. This is iconic kind of in late winter. I think people who really who grew up here as well, they think of, you know, they really have a, an association with the time of year when the Weesatch is in bloom because it is, it's just these bursts of yellow all over the place. And, um, you know, and you can you can buy these in nurseries, and we've had them for sale at our plant sales as well. And uh, um, you know, I've never tried growing it from seed, but it is available out there. Or else, if you're lucky enough to have one on your property, go ahead and prune it up and and give it a try. So. going to be, um, there's some persimmon kind of all, all along here we've got a border of persimmon and um, we can get a closer, closer look down below of, of some other ones, but a persimmon is uh, you know, an understory tree it's great at the edge of the woods or in the woods, but also in the sun, this I've seen some amazing big uh, persimmons, Texas persimmons, um, out in the sun. Older ones. Um, the bark of them is smooth and gray, kind of peeling, very similar to crepe myrtle. So it doesn't get your crepe myrtle flowers, but it just um, is really beautiful. Little leaves, uh, and it comes in male and female plants. So. Um, this is, I haven't found any female, or any, uh, um, they're about a marble shaped, at this time of year, a little green fruit on them. And uh, they will um, turn black and you don't want to plant them over your sidewalk or your driveway or something because they will stain it. People don't like that. So if you can source a male um, persimmon, that's what you want to do and to, to be closer to structures and, and whatnot. But it's not, it's not very tall, um, but it's, it, and it prunes well. And actually if you end up, if you're on a new property that's just been developed and they remove persimmon, they might start coming up from the ground and you can cultivate it from there by, by pruning it. Um, and if you do have these, uh, birds love to nest in these. So this is a great nesting site for birds. Um, and the fruit is actually edible for us as well. Um, if you've never had persimmon jelly, Texas persimmon jelly, um, try it. It's pretty good. 
um, but it's definitely something that is is good and drought resistant um, as our lovely Texas natives are so it doesn't require a whole lot of water yeah and you pretty easily found in the nursery but you're lucky if you've got one on your property all, already um, and uh, you know you can try growing it from seed as well so um, you know. If you do grow that one from seed, you'll want to scarify that yeah. seed. Um, otherwise, it's going to take a really long time. But if you just kind of nick it or take some sandpaper and really rough it up, um, then it, it germinates a lot quicker. Yeah, and it is eaten a lot by wildlife. When you see scat of uh, coyotes and raccoons out, you'll find it full of persimmon seeds when, uh, when they're in fruit. And if you're brave enough, then you could actually go ahead and try to plant them that's bed. true that's <laughs> true yeah <laughs> natural scarification <laughs> so but yeah it becomes a nice craggy uh, gray structure in the winter as well but you know that's part of our seasonality and, and you know so we know it's winter sometimes it may not feel like it but, but we know it is so our next one here is uh, frost wheat weed and um, frost wheat is an understory plant. You find it a lot under oaks, um, you know, wooded areas for the most part, but mostly I'd say under, under oaks. And unfortunately, it's one of the things that really gets scraped away um, on, de on development sites. You know, they clear out everything except the oak trees. And these grow under oaks, but they're just beautiful. It's sort of like instant landscaping under the oaks. But it's a perennial, and um, generally it can grow about this tall, six feet or so, yeah. in the um, in the fall. It blooms in the fall, um, which is well. I'll let Drake talk about how great that is when it blooms in the fall, but. They can still, I've seen ones this time of year that are about this tall. You can cut them in half at that time. It will still bloom and, um, you know, you won't hurt it. But in some landscapes, you may not want something that tall like in your front yard or something. A little too wild for you. Cut it back by half. Um, and it's got, uh, on the, one of the ways to tell it, it's got these very interesting wings on its, uh, on its stalk here that's sort of like just leaf material um, that kind of comes out on on all sides of the stalk and um, it also it's called frost weed because in the at the the first hard freeze in the winter it will um, either the sap in the in the stalks or in the roots underground will heave up and form ice sculptures. You can, you can Google that on, uh, you can Google it on the internet, um, you know, frost weed in winter or something, and you can see videos of the, the, these, these sculptures coming out. They're just gorgeous. So the first frost of the year, go out in the morning and look at your frost weed and see what you might find. Um, these, these will form a colony, so you probably want to cut it back um, if it's getting to an area too big. Um, it will seed out as well. I can see a couple other ones that are around in here. And, uh, but you can also separate, you know, dig some clumps, give them to your friends or whatever. This is not a plant that you'll find in the nurseries, so you'll find it at our plant sale, but yes, uh, or, or specialties. Uh, sellers of the plant um, and actually uh, yeah we should we should have some available this fall so, so be patient um, anyway but it's just it's one of my favorite landscaping plants that uh, that we have in in San Antonio in it's, this in this area and it's definitely so, one of mine and, yeah. and one of the um, main reasons why it's one of my favorite ones is two pollinators use it um, one pollinator is the border patch. This is in the sunflower family, so they use this as a host plant. So if you if you do already have this, um, and you actually see a leaf covered in like a hundred or more caterpillars, those are butterflies. So let them be. Um, they won't devour. Um, 
nature will take care of itself. Some of the birds might eat them. Um, but it's it's the host plant, and that's what it's there for. However, in fall, if you have this, and when this is blooming, this is the main nectar source of choice here in Bear County, um, as you the monarchs are migrating south to Mexico. Um, out of everything that I have had in my own habitat and other habitats that I have put, this is the one where they're draping from out of all the other choices that they have. So definitely if you don't have it, you want to get it. Um, and like Joan had mentioned too, if you've already had it and it's about this height, you could cut it back a little bit. Um, but I have some and I have up um, um, some pictures and things too where it's literally like five and six foot tall. And at that point, you want to cut it. You want to cut it back um, at least half, maybe a little bit more so that it can bunch out. Um, and then it's not top heavy because if you just let it grow, um, then it's going to get top heavy when it blooms and they're going to fall over. So you're helping it actually create a more sturdy plant. And this is a very forgiving plant. Um, like Joan had mentioned, it's, it's, if it starts to get too bunchy for the space that you put it in, you can easily separate it. If there are some that come up where you don't want them, you can easily pull them out, pot them up and give them to a friend or replant them somewhere else. But definitely one that you want to have in your landscape. Yeah, and there's um, another thing too that kind of for for winter care, you know, a lot of people in the, um, you know, at the end of fall and into winter, they're really looking forward to, they want to get rid of all the dead stalks in their yard. And in general, we we tend to promote leaving things until maybe they start re-sprouting from the base in, in the spring. So you may have some tall stalks and you can see some of last year's stalks here as well. And leaving those for the winter, they become habitat for, um, Native bees. for native bees and stuff um, that they will burrow in here and they'll live there for the winter so you really don't want to take away habitat from them for the winter so you may think it looks a little scraggly and undesirable but at the same time um, you know I a personal um, uh, belief of mine is in my landscape I don't just look for how perfect and beautiful it is, like, a, like a, the button bush flower is just so perfect and beautiful, but also how is it functioning in my landscape? Who's benefiting from that? that? It's not just me, it's about the insects and then what comes to the insects as well. It's so, all part of having a balanced ecosystem. Yeah. And you want to provide, you know, you're not providing just a flower. Um, a lot of people will, will tend to think of like, oh, it's, it's just about the flower and bringing the nectar. Um, but understanding what host plants even do, you, you have, if you want a colony of certain types of butterflies, you have to understand that the leaves are gonna get eaten. Um, and in order to continue that into your habitat, um, you have to have the host plants. So you can't have perfection because everything has to start to get balanced. Yes, you'll get eaten leaves. Yes, you'll get little holes in your plants. But as soon as everything else moves in and starts creating that balance, um, things will look appealing better to you. And then you'll start to understand nature a little bit more to where things in your eyes won't look as messy, um, especially during the winter time. People like to really whack things down. And if you have an HOA that requires you to, um, you can actually cut it and just kind of lean it up against somewhere instead of just throwing it out because you're still providing that habitat um, and maybe placing it in a place in your yard that's not sightful if you have an HOA and you're required to um, buy that HOA. All right. Um, moving on to the next one, you know, it looks like the pandemia over there is broken off. Is it? I think it is. Oh, so we're going to hit it. Cut it. Yeah, it looks like it broke. Well, anyway, we've got a beautiful one right here, though. So, Candelia, C O N D A L I A. It's probably one of the most seen plants that no one has ever noticed before, and it is gorgeous. So you see that the color of these leaves, um, and they stay kind of that fresh looking all summer long. So, I mean, when you're driving along the side of the road, you can tell a pendalia by the color of the leaf, regardless of, of the growing lines. season. It will, it is deciduous, it will lose its leaves. 
Um, it's got small thorns on it um, and tiny little berries. We saw one the other day. It's, it was also blooming. Here's a, there's a little tiny berry up there, I think. Mm -hmm. Right there, anyway. Um, some right here. Yeah. So some tiny. Um, then they'll and they turn black when they're when they're ripe. And it's it's a shrubby. Tr I mean, this one's gotten tall because it's down here in the shade and it's trying to find some sun. But usually it's in in pretty uh, you know partially to fully shaded areas. And it's just kind of innocuous. You don't really notice it, but it's so pretty. I have seen it in a landscape down in King William where they it was a new construction on a corner and they got two of these and they are and I said before it was deciduous that is absolutely wrong it's evergreen so you it will stay green all winter long and with the little the little thorns on it someone had it planted as a wonderful privacy screen um, on the cor on their corner lot and um, you know, it just because you can prune it to make it denser. I mean, this is an unusual form. I mean, some of these plants, the more wild ones, like with the button bush, you have to work on it to see how it's going to fit into your landscape. But um, it's a really common plant. And that being said, it's almost impossible to find in the nursery. So you might be lucky enough to have it come up in your landscape. Um, that's something that the Native Plant Society is on my list of plants that I want to start having available for people because I think it's a really a great addition to a landscape. They can be kept pruned really small and almost bonsai as well. So, you know, it doesn't have to be this tall, scraggly tree. And you also, you find it very often, you know, right here it's next to, you can see the bark of the persimmon along there as well. It's underneath an oak tree. There's a hackberry next to it, um, so uh, yeah. So anyway, and this is kind of just to jump back even a little bit to persimmon. So this is a there was a persimmon trunk that was cut off here, and then it sort of has has uh, sprouted out from there. But you can see how it's pretty. It's a pretty nice thick mm -hmm. uh, growth right here, and you could kind of keep that pruned in some way to keep it dense and, um, you know, if that, that works in your landscape, give that a try. So, did you have anything to add about that, uh, No, other than just the berries um, eaten by wildlife, uh, so it's definitely something that, that provides um, wildlife function as well, um, as well as habitats that birds and stuff might use for building nests. Here we've got one of our more contentious plants, the ash juniper. People, people love to hate it. <laughs> I, I love to love it, believe, believe it or not. And I um, love to love it too. Yeah, it is, um, it's another plant like persimmon that comes in male and female. Now everyone hates it because the male flowers in uh, you know, December, January um, put out a lot of pollen. And, um, and no matter how many junipers they take out of the landscape, you're still gonna have plenty of pollen there. So, um, but it's an evergreen tree. It makes a wonderful screen. They can, um, you know, they, they do sprout up kind of everywhere. You can keep them under control with, you know, just lopping them off at the base. You can take a larger tree and um, cut off some of the branches uh, to make it a more appealing shape. Um, if you've got them in your landscape, I think it's great. You're lucky. Um, no, you can't buy this anywhere in the nursery. I end up, I do have one and I live towards downtown. I have one in my yard because I brought in some duff from underneath some trees years ago and it had seeds in it and I sprouted some um, ash junipers. So we've got, and right now it looks like an Italian cypress. It's tall and straight and narrow, it's kind of unusual. But um, it's just, you know, I, I think it's a very versatile plant and it's not one that deserves to be hated or to completely stripped out of landscapes um, as development goes on. Um, and one of the reasons why I absolutely love it, this is a host plant for the Juniper Hair Street butterfly. Um, it's a small little butterfly that's 
about yay big um, and it has this kind of color to it it's really beautiful um, and it's needed it's needed in order to that's, that's all they um, host on so um, they don't host on anything else but also these berries um, are also edible and have if you're into like you know scenting your car if you actually just take a snip of this and were to just put it in a cup holder your car smells so good <laughs> um, so it's a natural air freshener as well um, but yeah it's, it's a really good um, habitat tree and I love it just for the fact that it's a host plant so if it's a host plant I love it yeah. um, it's needed and this is great uh, for birds lots of birds like to nest um, in there um, as well so it's definitely a, a wildlife needed um, tree what, what's kind of neat too is as a host plant the caterpillar for the juniper hair streak butterfly you'll be hard-pressed to find it in the tree I mean I have looked and looked and looked <laughs> until one year I saw a piece of silk hanging down and I thought well what is that there was a little tiny caterpillar on the end I put it in my hand I thought it looks exactly like cedar needles so that's what that was the way to finally see the caterpillar from that I've seen the butterflies but not the caterpillar um, but also as a plant too it's extremely drought tolerant you want to kill them you water them <laughs> that's um, that's a way to kill your uh, your ash juniper yeah and believe it or not a lot of natives are that way <laughs> if yeah, you want to yeah. kill them water them mm -hmm. um, because many natives don't like water at all so i know it's hard to believe and many people are like what really but yes um in, in your landscapes natives they don't require and don't like a lot of water yeah. which is good it's why we go native anyway yeah. so our next one is actually growing up here on the the juniper and this is one of our native uh, passion flower vine species and um, we've actually, on, on the, the spreadsheet, we've listed it as um, yellow passion flower vine. And we've, we're in a debate as to whether it's the yellow pa passion flower or the bracted pa passion flower. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to wait until it blooms. It has a very small, insignificant bloom on it. Most people think of passion flowers as these big, gorgeous things. Well, this is a little gorgeous thing. Yes, it's literally and, like um, the, the, no bigger than your, your pinky nail. Yeah. Um, it's very small, yeah. and the fruit is also very small. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, if you have this, you're lucky. You have this just naturally growing in your yard. There are several different native types of passion flower, um, and it's the host plant for four different butterflies here in Bear County. And those butterflies are the most common being the Gulf fritillary, um, and then you have your zebra longwing, your Julia, and your variegated fritillary. So that's four different butterflies that use this as a host plant. Um, the blooms are used by all types of pollinators, from butterflies to um, honeybees to native bees. And hummingbirds absolutely love it. So if you have this, um, you're one, definitely lucky if you have it um, while that it's just naturally growing there. Um, but you will um, find some of these at specialty um, nurseries that have them available. Um, definitely will have some for the native plant sale um, in the fall. Um, and um, or, or you'll be lucky and you might just find one volunteering yes. in your yard and that's, especially if you've got more of a want you're closer to some wild areas and you know the passion flower vines are all they these lobed um leaves going up the up the vine and we've got several species and you can usually at least identify something as a passion flower vine yep maybe not you won't get the species but sometimes that doesn't really matter just exactly. being able to say it's a passion flower vine is, is good enough yep um, and if you want to know and you're curious as to to what because even if you're in the inner city or where wherever you're at in San Antonio um, I know a lot of people that have this and other passion vines that are just popping up they just didn't realize what they were so they were either pulling them out um, uh, or mowing them which which can happen too um, so it's just kind of discovering what you already have you can download an app iNaturalist and you can just start taking pictures and it will help a lot to ID what you have already in your yard um, but yeah take notes on what you want to get and add into your landscapes 
uh, for pollinators and wildlife. Okay, moving along here, uh, another favorite of mine, I've got many favorites right here. This is the um, kidney wood and uh, another airy little uh, leaf on it. It's very aromatic. If you were, it's kind of, um, some people call it cit citrusy. I call it, I don't know, it's acrid almost. I don't know. But that also help, is, is really a diagnostic. If you come across it and you crush the leaves, you'll be able to, uh, to smell that. Um, it is deciduous, so it's gonna lose its leaves in the winter. Um, and it's got, it's very, very fine branching and, and a little wispy as well. Another one that can truly uh, be pruned in your landscape to however you want it to look. I've seen it out in the hill country because deer will browse this, believe it or not, for something that's so pungent. Um, they'll browse it and so I've seen them basically create a bonsai of it, which makes a really pretty dense, um, small uh, green bush during the growing season. Uh, but it's really, it does have a nice place in your landscape. Um, and you know, you can do some things under it. It can be understory for other things, but um, you can find it's pretty readily available in the nurseries, believe it or not, too. And we usually have some at our sales as well. Uh, but, um, you know, and it's just kind of part of the, Part of the scenery here, um, you see there, there's quite a bit of it growing down um, off the boardwalk here. Um, but again, this is one of, one of the taller ones. Um, and it does bloom white. There were a, a, a few blooms on it the other day, but I don't see any right now. Yep. Um, but the white blooms are, are kind of elongated um, and, and they're really pretty. And a lot of your uh, native bees love it. They're, they're covered in it. Um, and when it, we get a really good rain, um, too, is typically when it starts to kind of burst out um, and bloom. And it's very, it's a very nice, uh, soft scent. It's nothing that's overpowering um, when it's in bloom. Yeah, no, it's very, yeah, very repetitive through through the summer um, for blooming. Um, so, but you know, they're they're somewhat indiscreet, but no, but they're it's quite nice. Might want to focus over here. Here is a, a female uh, persimmon, Texas persimmon, right here. So just so you get an eye on what the fruits look like. Those are those are not ripe. Um, they're kind of velvety on the outside, and uh, they will turn sort of a black uh, color by, I guess, in summer, mm -hmm. late summer. This is the. Okay, that's right. That's right. So hackberry, the trash tree that also everyone loves to hate, um, <laughs> is, to love. yeah, and it's it's really a very useful tree. There's a lot of species of hackberries. Um, this is just one of the common ones. Um, you know, it's 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 deciduous. It's it's a challenging tree in in many situations. Um, it sheds branches quite readily. Um, and you know it can get as you can see from the leaves lots of things like to eat them there's aphids they drop dew on the ground um, so people don't want it near their houses or their cars understandably but um, it's an incredibly useful tree and um, and prolific we have a lot of them in San Antonio and in the right place you might want to keep it but you often find them on along fence lines and under power lines because that's where birds are perching. So obviously birds eat the berries quite a bit. Um, but it's if it's in the right place in your yard and away from your house and away from the power lines, you might consider keeping it. And you probably, a lot of the little ones, you might want to cut out of your garden as you see coming up. It's sort of a pet peeve of mine is in people's uh, shrub borders when you see a <laughs> a big uh, hackberry coming out of it. It's like, well, is that really the best place for that hackberry? But anyway, Drake can really talk about how great it is otherwise. Yes. Um, so this is a very important tree, and I know many love to hate it. Um, but this tree 
is just as important as our native oak trees. And one of the reasons being it is feeds 250, over 250 different species of wildlife. Um, a lot of butterflies use this as a host plant as well as some silk moths and um, other important sphinx moths and, that are also pollinators. Um, so this is used by the Hackberry Emperor, the um, Tawny Emperor, the Princess Lila, and the, um, the uh, question mark uh, butterfly and not in San Antonio, but in other areas around Texas, the um, common, or the comma. So yes, those are actual butterflies, question mark. The butterfly has a question mark. And without the dot, it makes it a comma. Um, they both look exactly the same. But that's how you tell the difference. We don't get commas here in, in Bear County, but they do in the surrounding areas and more north. So these are an important tree for that. Um, and if you have little ones that are kind of away from important areas, you can actually keep them kind of trimmed um, to a height that's just above your knee or maybe waist high and keep it that way. Um, one of the reasons you may want to do that is because you can reach and see caterpillars that are actually laying their eggs. They like to lay their eggs on new growth. So if you keep it high, um, then it'll continue to give that new growth where you can actually collect or watch and view the different caterpillar um, life cycles on it. When you're doing that, that tree is probably only going to last about three to five years. Um, because it's constantly being cut down, it's just going to eventually give up. Um, but I promised you somewhere else, and you probably already know, it's somewhere else in your yard anyway. But that um, constant pruning, it won't keep it and allow it to be a, a big tree. And at some point, which typically is three to five years, it will give up and just... Um, not make it and then you move on to the next so it's not a long-term commitment it, if you want exactly. to give it a try it's going to be gone in a couple years exactly so give it exactly. a try or if you're trying to eradicate it too if you're trying to eradicate it just know that hey if you just keep chopping away at it um then it's just going to eventually give up and not make it and that process is actually called stooling <laughs> that was new to me when <laughs> i thought drake had a, a typo when she sent me her, her notes and she said well then the hackberry can you know it can you know you can stool it and I said is that a typo or what is that <laughs> autocorrect what do you mean <laughs> so and, and walking through here you're gonna see you know quite a few more here's the, the persimmons as well you know, and it's really great during the day, in the morning, um, to, uh, or different times of day, to go out to your yard and take a look at it. Because it's, there's something different happening all during the day. I was out the other morning, and um, after we'd had the rain, I thought, well, there's a couple things that could be cut back a little bit. I know they're really going to come back because it's had the moisture. And as I was, you know, putting my hands, it was down around fall asters or something, then I'd find a butterfly that I flushed out. So, you know, knowing that that's where he spent the night, you know, so having that kind of structure is important. And then, you know, I thought, well, I could take some of the mealy blue sage stalks off um, of the, the, the past flowers. And then I saw a spider web from the oak tree down to one of those. And I'm like, well, that's structure in the yard there, too. So, you know, you don't want to do no harm, you know, do, you know, take, do some work out there, but keep some things knowing that it's serving, its purpose. Yeah, it's serving a purpose and it has a function. And, you know, these are things that, like, I only saw that early in the morning. And, you know, in the middle of the day, I never would have noticed that or that wouldn't have been happening. So. And, a, and a lot of people don't think about um, butterflies, like, where do they sleep? And this is also important um, when you're trying to clean up areas in the winter. Um, but typically, yeah, butterflies will roost and sleep in your trees um, amongst your little shrubs and plants. I actually have um, some flame acanthus that I know is a big spot that a lot of butterflies go in there and that's that's their house for the night um but then also over winter in these in these places so in your leaf litter in this in the different structures that are dense um this is where they live that's the habitat that's what you're creating or you're wanting to create and if you're seeing this you're doing a good job down here we have um 
This is a, a um, snapdragon vine. Unfortunately, it's not blooming right now because it has a beautiful sort of um, violet rose colored flower that looks like a snapdragon. And um, as you can see, it's, it's very dense um, and uh, grows well from seed. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's great for covering a fence or, you know, I've got it growing up over some, some, uh, you know, um, some flowers that bloomed in the spring. So it's, you know, that's forming structure for it. Um, ground cover as well, uh, you know, and it's just a really, a really nice, um, unusual one. Actually, that one's growing all over in Agarita, which we're going to cover in a minute. And, um, but you know, these just sweet, sweet little flowers on it. And um, they, uh, yeah, and you know, grow from seed. And, and you it know, grows like, really, yeah. really easily from yes, seed. Yes, it does. Um, I have had where I had it growing um, and it was blooming in the spring and I just took some seed and, and, and tossed it into another spot um that same spring and by fall i had it growing um in the other spot that i have wanted it so it grows really easy from seed and this is a host plant or one of the host plants um, for the common buckeye butterfly so a very useful plant again um anything that has to do with a, a larval host um, i love it because that creates more butterflies without host plants you're not going to create more butterflies um but it's real easy and um, I have seen uh, in my experience where if we don't get a hard freeze um, for long enough, then it can also be, um, it can stay green. It's not considered an evergreen. It, it is considered yeah. um, deciduous, but if it stays warm enough, it stays green. This past uh, winter, uh, mine has been green. It hasn't died back. cover on the list or the map though but since it's blooming right here is the Zexmenia which is a great little wild um, yellow composite plant that um, it's it may it may keep a little green in the winter um, but it is also a host plant for at least one kind of the butterfly. Butter, the, yep, the border patch yeah. butterfly um, um, uses that yeah. one as well. And any time that I thought, well, it looks a little ratty in my yard, I want to cut it back, um, then I'll see a goldfinch perched on the end of one of those flowers eating seeds, and I say, no, forget it, it's serving someone else. And, um, but it's very, very easily found in the, in the uh, nursery trade, so that's a really great one. And, and it'll bloom all summer long. Yep, and it does good in full sun or some dappled um, sun as well. So it's not something that um, needs just one area. It can go in a couple of areas and do really well. Yeah. And another one too that when it's established, it doesn't need any water, zero water, and it's fine. <laughs> so this is um, an agarita and you can find um, agaritas uh, in the nursery trade. Um, they can be of many sizes, but it prunes very well. It's got beautiful bright orange um, wood inside of it. Um, evergreen and very spiky sharp leaves, so it's a great thing to plant somewhere if you don't want anyone walking through or under a window or something. Um, likes full sun, can take, can take some shade, doesn't like deep shade, it doesn't get as full if it's in deep shade. Uh, but um, it's also an early blooming plant as well, uh, so you know, for early pollinators, really, really useful plant. Um, and but again, it prunes, it prunes back very nicely. This is a little wild for many people's uh, um, yards. Preference, yeah. right. Um, and the, the flowers on this, when it's in bloom, you can, it's very light. It's not anything that's pungent and overwhelming, but you're, you'll walk out and you'll just kind of be like, oh, that smells so good, what is it? And it's the agarita. If you have this and you walk by, or even if you're coming through on a walk, um, like here at Silver Burger Park, 
then you're going to be able to enjoy the blooms on that and it's it's a really nice um, scent plus um, you can make agarita jelly from the berries on that as well so if you're into that kind of thing lots of uses I always like to say hey don't just plant for us plant for them so when you're planting for them we get rewards in it too. and then here um, the one grass will cover this is uh, probably familiar to many people. It's Lindheimer's muley or big muley grass. And uh, it's, I mean, you can see, it's just a nice large clump grass that doesn't get usually a whole lot bigger than this. Um, but it's got long, long uh, leaves. So you really want to keep it, when you plant it, this is about two and a half feet from the sidewalk. You might even go three feet because you'll see it planted. It's, it's used a lot in landscaping and people will, when they're nice and small in a one gallon pot, they'll put it right up next to the sidewalk and then they come up and they, since it's over the sidewalk, they prune it back from the sidewalk. So, um, you know, you want to put it in the right place. It can be a mass planting on a border or um, a specimen plant somewhere. Uh, beautiful, beautiful blooms in the late summer that, that stay up. These are last year's. Um, this actually looks like a new one. It's a little early for it. And um, really doesn't require any maintenance. You do not need to go in. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Finish that. I have a yeah. question uh, okay. that we missed on a previous plant, okay. but go ahead. So, um, but you don't need to prune it back to look like um, a bowling ball or anything. That's absolutely not even recommended. You want to mm -hmm. go in and either with a rake or your hands, just pull out the dead, if you even want to do that. You don't have to do that, because um, there's a lot of moths and other little critters that use this for, for habitat and cover. So, and I've seen many birds, too, that will come yeah. in, and they like to grab the strands, and they'll use them to make their nest. So you definitely don't want to take out everything um, and one of the things that I, I kind of, my stomach kind of flops when I see it. In the winter, people like to just chop it off. <laughs> um, and when you do that, you take the risk of possibly even losing the plant. It's meant to look this way. Um, and it's a good reason to kind of, hey, sit back and think about what you're planting. Do your research, understand how big that plant is gonna get. Cause like Joan said, yes, when it's in a one gallon pot and you're putting it right next to the um, sidewalk, then it's going to be way too big and it's, it grows fairly fast so um, just in a couple of years it will be uh, big like this and will be in the way but yeah it's typically even if you don't want to use um, your, your hands you could take a small little rake and rake out if you needed to but if you're going to do that kind of toss it aside somewhere um, so that the, at least the birds can can take that nesting and and or take or that or use it as mulch yep use it as mulch but as well yeah. and one thing that i like to um talk about when we talk about native grasses no one really thinks about butterflies on grasses um but we have several different types of grass skippers um you have your orange uh, skipperling your fiery skipper your dune skipper lots of different grass dipper skippers that use native grasses as their host plant so um, that's definitely one of the reasons why too and with the little blooms that come um, I have seen in my own my own self um, different butterflies that were nectaring um, off of the blooms too so it's, it's important all the way around and naturally we don't think about grass and butterflies but native grasses are very important for our grass skippers so our question was uh, earlier that we missed is uh, does snapdragon like part shade yeah, it can take part shade and it can take full sun. Um, I have some heavily growing on a fence that, you know, right by my garage that gets probably, you know, not very much direct sun during the day, but, you know, certainly all shaded in the afternoon and it blooms and it's very, I'm starting to pull it away now because it's a little narrow space and <laughs> it's going a little crazy. So yeah, it'll take part shade for sure. and I think. It'll take it, some heavier shade yeah. too. It, it, it's pretty happy anywhere. Um, it full, full sun, dappled, and, and full shade. I have it in all three spots, and it does fabulously and blooms just as prolifically in either of those spots. So it's not like you'll get some plants will like okay, they'll bloom great in the full sun, and you'll get less blooms. 
um, in shaded areas, but this one, it blooms the same, whether it's full sun or shade. Mm -hmm. so. And this is, this is our, uh, our last plant that we planned on, on covering today, which is the rock rose. Um, that being said, I don't think I've ever seen rock rose out in the wild. I've only seen it here um, in, in nurseries and in landscapes, but um, it is just a really great, uh, great plant for, for show all summer long. These beautiful pink um, hibiscus, they're related to the hibiscus family, or they're in the hibiscus family, right? Yeah, yeah. the yes. mallow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's deciduous. You can see a lot of the structure under, um, you know, in the background there of these smooth um, kind of grayish uh, branches. And um, this plant really takes to uh, pruning very well during the year, um, you know, and in the summer too. As you can see, this one's pretty big and, and sprawling. Um, you can cut it back to a more compact shape if, if that's what you want. Um, it does bloom best with the more sun it gets, but yes. it, and it's a little rangier if it gets less, less sun. And it will, you can see a lot of these, I think, have already, there's seed, seed pods on them. Um, Little seed heads, yeah. Seed heads somewhere. That are starting this here. Will, like these ones this are green. will reseed heavily underneath it. But, you know, once you know what those li these little leaves look like when they start coming up, you just pull them out. It's not a problem. And, you know, you want to leave one or two anyway because this will li live maybe five years or so. And that's um, another thing to, to think about when you think about plants. Um, many times, us as people, we, we tend to believe that the plants are going to live forever. Um, and many plants have a shelf life. So that depends on is it 100 years or is it just a couple of years, um, like this one being typically it will last about four to five years until the new ones are coming up. So yes, you could say, hey, I've had this in my landscape for um, 10 years. But most likely you're having something that's receded itself um, where the other ones have kind of died back. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of point out, if you happen to see like yeah. this little powdery mildew, um, this is very common um, on this plant and typically happens when we get a lot of rain, it'll happen even more so. Um, you don't have to do anything about that. It's not gonna harm the plant. Um, it's not going to do if you you can clip it if you want to, but you really don't it's, have it's to. It's unavoidable. Yeah, it's, it it's going to happen. Territory. Yep. And then another thing, um, as we were talking about pruning, if you could see here how this is kind of if this were at your house um, and you had some you know steps here, then obviously you would want to take it away, um, and so you can prune it back. This is a plant that's very forgiving and responds to pruning and heavy pruning really well. So don't worry, don't be afraid to cut your plants. Um, there are certain ones that even in summer, it's okay and it's not gonna harm them at all. And it'll actually benefit because they'll thicken up um, and bush up nicely and bloom more. Yeah, yeah. And another thing too, just when it comes to pruning, you know, I really recommend that if, you know, if your steps were here, you don't just go and you cut it straight down and have that be you just you go in individual branches you know you cut in at different lengths it's sort of like you know instead of chopping your bangs straight across you're kind of giving a little bit more uh wispy interest look. yeah <laughs> wisp, wispy look yeah so you know go in and take individual branches and then just cut them that way to, to leave it a little more ragged and it won't look like it's just had a haircut and exactly. trying to come back from it you'll still be happy with the way it looks after you've, after you've trimmed it. And if you're nervous about it, it's really easy. If you just take a couple of, of, of cuttings and then just kind of step back and see how it looks um, aesthetically, then you can see where, okay, you know what, I've done good there. Let me come on, uh, over to another section. Mm -hmm. Take a couple of uh, cuts, step back. Um, that way you're still getting uh, a look. And when, when you kind of step back, it helps you see the shape that you're, you're actually forming um, when you're doing the cutting. This I like because, um, as with most of the mallow plants, this is also a host plant. This is a host plant for the gray um, hair streak butterflies, um, and they love to lay their flo their flowers. They love to lay their eggs on the flowers and buds. Um, and so this it's an important host plant as well. Um, the gray hair streaks they use a lot of different um, plants in the mallow family. 
um, but if you have this one, you'll be able to see them um, lay that and you'll, you'll get a lot of those butterflies in your habitat as well. We had a question. Where do y'all suggest that people can get some of these plants that aren't common in the nursery trade? Where do you suggest? Um, my, well, I guess there's three suggestions. <laughs> uh, one is there's a nursery in Medina, Texas, up Highway 16 called Medina Garden Nursery. And um, the guy there, Ernesto, is Fabulous. so, yeah, he's so knowledgeable and he's just got some really unusual things. He does a lot of his seed and plant collection himself, so he even knows where the original plant came from. Um, and so it's a lot of, uh, he'll, I mean, he's got things that are, are, aren't native to Texas, maybe into Mexico, whatever, but for the most part, um, anyway, he's a great source. Um, our Native Plant Society, uh, we have, n under normal situation, we have two plant sales a year, actually, at Hardburger Park. The spring one was canceled this year. We're working on a concept for some sort of a fall event where people can get some plants, not as big as our normal sale. But in a normal year, you'd be able to find a good number of these plants with us. And then as well, Drake is a grower and yes. seller of um, native plants. So if you're looking uh, for different things that aren't typically um, and readily available, especially when it comes to different host plants, um, the nectar bar, yeah, look it up and, and check them out and check me out. <laughs> yeah. um, because there's a lot of things that I have readily available um, that are native and host plant specific. So yeah, I think that was that was where we uh, we wrapped up our um... wonderful. Does anybody else have any questions? If you do, please post them in the uh, comments, and we will be uh, taking a look at this throughout the weekend and be replying to comments as as possible. Thank you so much, uh, Drake and Joan, for for this lovely talk. Also, if you missed it or you tuned in towards the end, we are going to be posting this full video on our website by the end of the week. Um, and yes, we can post a link to the Nectar Bar uh, as, uh, alongside with the video and a link to the Native Plant Society as well. So, well, thank you very much, Joan and Drake and everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a good weekend. And come out and try to find these plants yourself. Get out in nature. The tools are there. <laughs>